What do you think your superpower in business is? Delegating. My ability to actually pass on like very critical activities that is absolutely required for the business to succeed. I am very effective at delegating to whether it be somebody who knows very little about our business, whether it's somebody, you know, internal that knows a lot. I think that's something it was really hard in the beginning, but I was always okay. Like just, I gotta just like, I gotta try. And then I'd be okay with the failure. And I think another, you know, kind of a, a level to the superpower is the ability to allow people the latitude to fail and allow people to go learn a lesson. And so, you know, I have a motto, we have a motto within the business. It's like fail fast, go make a mistake. Now there's no excuse for making that same mistake a bunch of times in a row, just stupid, but go make a mistake, go try something. If you're not making mistakes, you're not trying hard enough. Heroes are an inspiring group of people. Every one of them from the larger than life comic book heroes you see on the big silver screen, the everyday heroes that let us live the privileged lives we do. Every hero has a story to tell. From the doctor saving lives at your local hospital, the war veteran down the street who risked his life for our freedom, to the police officers and the firefighters who risk their safety to ensure ours. Every hero is special and every story worth telling. But there is one class of heroes that I think is often ignored. The entrepreneur, the creator, the producer, the ones who look at the problems in this world and think to themselves, you know what? I can fix that. I can help people. I can make a difference. Then they go out and do exactly that by creating a new product or introducing a new service. Some go on to change the world. Others make a world of difference to their customers. Welcome to The Hero Show. Join us as we pull back the masks on the world's finest heropreneurs and learn the secrets to their powers, their success, and their influence. So you can use those secrets to attract more sales, make more money, and experience more freedom in your business. I'm your host, Richard Matthews, and we are on in three, two, one. Hello and welcome back to The Hero Show. My name is Richard Matthews. And today I have the pleasure of having on the line Joe Rare. Joe, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Awesome. I didn't uh, accidentally rhymed there. Rare and are you there? I, so... <laughs> <laughs> I thought you did uh, it on purpose. No, it did not. <laughs> but you do have a rare name. So that one I did on purpose. But <laughs> there we go. So what I want to do before we get uh, too far into this, I always like to do a brief introduction for our audience so they know who you are, and then we'll just dive into your story. So Joe Rare is an underground serial entrepreneur, investor, outsourcing expert, father, and husband. Currently owns four digital companies, five wedding venues, and real estate investment properties. Joe's journey began with a door-to-door product sales business, which grew from a team of two to 40 employees in under two years. He later sold that company after 27 months. But his passion for sales never dimmed. He discovered that his life works with what it would be, which is building digital businesses. The road was definitely made of dirt with a lot of potholes. There were failed businesses in the early days, but he took the failures and learned to create wins. He has since built multiple seven-figure companies and built a strong and growing real estate portfolio. And you focus on helping small to medium-sized businesses around the world while working from the comfort of his home in Montana, enjoying big sky country with his family. He's an investor and looks to find projects that he can use his marketing leverage to impact growth and profitability. All of his companies are being fully run by his virtual assistants. So what I want to start off with then, Joe, is who you are now. What are you famous for? Like, what do you do? You know, who do you serve? Like, what's the main sort of like crux of what you offer in the marketplace? Yeah, so I'm the outsource guy. <laughs> and so kind of my, I guess, claim to what I call underground fame has been that I build businesses that run without me. And so I have virtual assistants and my core business level nine virtual is a virtual assistant services business. It's the biggest business that we have. And that is 95 to 97% run completely by virtual assistants overseas in the Philippines. And so we recruit from the Philippines and South America and, you know, a few other places, but for the most part, the team that actually operates the company is in the Philippines. And so what I've become known for is the ability to build a business, create a process that we can replicate over and over. So I did it once with one business and I thought, oh my God, I wonder if I could do that with this other thing. And then I did it again. And then I went, oh, I wonder if I could do it with this other thing. And then I did it again. And then the history is a little, a little off. We do have six companies now and they're completely run by virtual assistants. And so that's really what my core kind of what I'm known for and who we serve is, is pretty much all small businesses. We have a huge uh, footprint in the agency space simply because agencies are very well known in using virtual assistants. And so it was kind of an easy lean to for us to get in. And so that's really who we serve the most. And any small business that has tasks that they keep thinking in their head, I need to get these done. And then they never get them done, which is most small business owners. That is our target market. We take things off your plate. We give you your time back. And so our focus is like you can see in the background, get more done, increase profit and free your time. And that's it. 
I have to say, I love that. We run an agency. So we run an agency called Push Button Podcasts and our the overwhelming majority of our team is in the Philippines. And yep. so we've got that. And we have a few, we have a few US employees as well, but the overwhelming majority of our staff is in the Philippines. And I don't know, we've, I like, I, we don't generally call them virtual assistants because we hire them all full time on yeah. staff, sure. but it's the yeah. same thing, right? They're yeah. virtually working. Our whole, our whole office and team is virtual. And yeah. so, you know, we stuck, yeah. it, it's interesting that you brought that up because I have wrestled with the term virtual assistants for years and years and years. And in our case, we actually provide the service to the market. And the hard part is, is we've tried everything from virtual staff, but now because of COVID, everybody thinks that's just somebody here who's just not going to come into the office. They're just going to be at home and, but they still work within the company. And so virtual staff had became its own meaning. You know, there's a lot of people who have tried like online Filipino specialists and they've tried all of these different names. But the problem is, is that the market as a whole knows the term virtual assistant and it, there is a correlation to what that means. So us as a service provider saying, Hey, we can help you hire somebody who is a virtual assistant to work in your business under X, Y, Z role. That's the only mm -hmm. reason we still use the term is because the market knows it. And instead of trying to reframe the market's, you know, understanding and re-educate them and create a different, you know, work phrase we just decided to stick with what people know and it's worked. <laughs> so that's the only yeah, reason yeah. we kept and, it. And I, I get that. And we actually, I use the term virtual assistant when we're looking for people. I said, hey, we're looking to hire a virtual assistant. Yeah. But then we bring them on. We just call them staff, right? You're you're on our staff. 100%. Yep. That's how our team <laughs> is as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because you know that's it's what the market calls your staff in other countries, right? And you know, as we're we're getting more into it in our company, you're starting to learn about things like employer of record and other things. So we can have what do you call it, like partial ownership of the company and those kind of things. There's all sorts sure. of other stuff. Like as you start getting getting more into it, you realize it's a lot more than an assistant. There's a lot more things that that happen there. But to your point, 100%. the market calls yeah. them virtual assistants, so that's what you call them in the marketplace yeah. if you're trying well, to hire funny. someone. If we're or... trying to recruit. Yeah, if we're trying to recruit somebody too. We would have to call it, you know, hey, a virtual assistant. We'd have to go find a virtual assistant to bring them in and let them work in our business because that's what they call themselves until they get a role. And then they go, well, okay, now I'm an operations director. I'm a project manager. I'm a, you know, a media buyer, whatever. But yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Yeah, absolutely. So you said you have six companies. So I see level nine there. What are the other ones? Yeah. So we have a wedding booking system, which is my marketing agency that serves wedding venues. And we have a SaaS product on the back end, but we do full, you know, for the most part, full service marketing, advertising, and kind of sales opportunities for wedding venues specifically. And so I had that business before level nine virtual and level nine virtual actually started because we used to serve we used to provide virtual assistance to our marketing agency clients. And then we said, well, you know, we keep giving these you know, the secrets away, why don't we just build a business around it? And so we did. So obviously that then level nine virtual came around as we were traveling through, you know, kind of the COVID era and we were looking for a new place to live. We were doing some traveling and we noticed that campgrounds are notorious for having horrible marketing. And unless they're owned yeah. by when you're a full-time traveler, so you know this, right. And yeah. unless they're, it's a big ownership, it's a KOA or it's a thousand trails, they're terrible at marketing. And so as we were traveling around a lot, we were trying to decide where we were going to move we kept running into the same thing. We don't know anything about this, this campground, this RV park. And we were trying to find places to stay and it was driving me so crazy. I'm like, you know, I think there's an opportunity here. And so we created a little landing page. I had my, my team do it. And then as we were going, we just started calling RV parks and campgrounds and saying, Hey, you know, we were going to book with you, but we can't understand this, this, and this about your, your business. Would you like some help? We actually do that. And then after we got a bunch of clients on board and we had a bunch of campgrounds. We were doing marketing for campgrounds. We then built campground digital, which we still haven't even like fully built a brand around it. We still use the same landing page that we always have. And we still serve about 30 clients currently and they're on autopilot. And so the, the team runs that. So that's three. Then we have a uh, visitor match, which is an identity resolution. It's a data provider, data service. And so everybody is trying to get eyeballs to their website and they get traffic to their website, 75, 80% of every single visitor is going to bounce off the site. We have the ability to match through pixel matching, IP matching, and a bunch of other data points. We can match the person who visited and left your site to an actual user profile that exists in 
data somewhere, right? Maybe they opted in to have their data sold from Netflix or Hulu or Bank of America or the mortgage company or credit card, whoever. And that data is sold, it's aggregated and all that stuff. And then we match against that to create profiles. And so we can increase your lead flow simply by matching against people who visit your website who left. So we call them anonymous website visitors. And then we identity match them, give you the profile of the person and you can run your marketing back to them upload them into the ad platforms. So that's visitor match. So what's that, is that for? Wow, that's and cool. then we have, yeah. And then we have flat rate, well, flat rate dispatchers, which is a freight dispatching company. I know nothing about freight dispatching, but my business partner in the thing said, came to me and he said, you know, Hey, I got this great idea. You know, let's get into dispatching. And I'm like, I don't think you can just become a 911 dispatcher. And he goes, no, 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 like freight. And I'm like, I still don't know what you mean. And he's like, all these trucks that are driving around, there was somebody who coordinated them picking up the load and then dropping it off. That's a dispatcher. And I'm like, oh, interesting. What am I going to do with that? And he says, we'll have you know, the team in the Philippines do it. And I'm like, is that even possible? And so next thing you know, we've got a business where we do freight dispatching. And then, and then the last one is that we have a SaaS product that works within our marketing agency. And so technically, I guess it's five now because we, we kind of, rather than having them decoupled, we actually merge them. And so Wedding Booking System has its own SaaS product, Marketing Automation, it's a white label. And then we sell that independently is why it kind of seems like six businesses. So there you go. So those are the- And then, those and are then the you also have your real estate investing portfolio, which is yes. sort of like a business as well. Oh, that's its own. <laughs> that's its own business. Yeah. So, <laughs> so when of, people say serial, those, yeah, I was to say each of those independent, you know, pieces of real estate sometimes act as their own, you know, business, each one of them. So it becomes a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So when people say serial entrepreneur, what they mean is you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> or yeah. they, or I think they also use uh, the term like nutcase, like crazy. <laughs> yeah, that works. That works too. I still just have the one business, and you know, once we get around to making it profitable every month, we might start talking about more. But right now, that's that's where we're yeah, at. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what I want to talk about then is your origin story, right? Every good comic book hero has an origin story, whether that's the thing that uh, made them into the hero they are today. And we want to hear that story. Were you born a hero, or were you bit by a radioactive spider that made you think, you know what, I can start a business in six or seven different categories, no problem? <laughs> or did you start a <laughs> job and eventually become an entrepreneur basically where'd you come from so you know it i'm like where did it start and, and that's a tough question it, it came from a realization that i don't think i fully realized until i was older but it still struck me when i was a kid and so i had to be i don't know nine or ten years old and a friend of my a friend of mine his dad used to take us oh, i grew up in northern california and he used to take us to oakland a's baseball games in the middle of the summer, in the middle of the week though, like on a weekday. And it always blew my mind. I'm like, because everybody I know, their parents are working, my parents are working. And I'm like, so how is this guy able to just pack? Like he would just take us to games all the time. And I'm like, first of all, you have the money to do it because we didn't. Second, you can take the time off in the middle of the week while everybody else is working. And it just like blew my mind. And I didn't realize how much of an impact that had on me until later, you know, I was finishing high school and we were taking a a road trip to go visit my grandparents in Canada in Winnipeg, which is, you know, kind of north of North Dakota and Minnesota. And we drove from Northern California all the way across, you know, Nebraska, then up through South Dakota and onward. And during that time, I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I think during that trip, I read it about four times and I was a teenager, but it immediately stuck with me and something to do with understanding like my childhood, you know, that friend's dad and that, and the concept of not building wealth for other people, but doing it for yourself really, really, really hit home. And so that's where I said, I I remember distinctly, we were in Minnesota doing something like going to Walmart or something. And I remember saying to myself flat out, I will not build somebody else's wealth and I will create my own. And it was from then on, I knew that I was going to be an entrepreneur. And I literally dropped out of college to go build businesses. And that's how I started my first business and sold it two and a half years later, or I think we were at 27, 28 months. But that's how it it started. Nice. That's That's really cool. I had a similar experience. My dad brought home a copy of Rich Dad, Poor Dad for me. And I was like nine or 10 years old. One of his friends at work was like, I think your son would enjoy this. And so they brought it home, had a little sticky note on it. It's like, yeah, I think you'd enjoy this kind of thing. And I did the same thing. I read the book four times in one evening at that age. And like the next morning, I was like, dad, I read the book like four times cover to cover. He was like, what? 
<laughs> yeah, that's crazy. And so, that's crazy. Yeah. And it started me on on that whole journey and you know the did everything from starting my first like candy wholesaling business on campus at like 13 to i paid my way through college as a wedding photographer and started a marketing agency after oh, college sweet. i dropped out of college as well about six weeks before college was done too i could probably i could go back and get a degree like six weeks later but i was like i just didn't care and yeah <laughs> and you know the rest is history sometimes you know yeah. It's funny, actually. I mean, kind of a fun little fact is Rich Dad Poor Dad was the first book that I actually ever fully read my entire life. So even through school, oh, I would cool. never read a whole book. I would only skim it and I would like figure out what I need to do to pass a test. But I hated reading as a kid. That book got me hooked into like education. But even then when I went off to college, I still wouldn't read the books that I was supposed to be reading. I would read books about business. And then that didn't help me do well in college. And so I'm like, well, I went to school to play basketball, but I'm 5'11 and I'm not really going to play. And so I, you know, after I sat the bench for a year, I was like, all right, I'm, I think I'm, I'm over it. Yeah. But, yeah. So anyway, that was See, that. I, I discovered early with my son, he's not a reader either, but he likes the audible. And so we started getting him an audible oh, yeah. subscription about like nine or 10 years old. And he's had it for several years now. And he gets credits every every month and I just tell him every yeah. other credit needs to be spent on a you know business leadership book. And he's read everything, like almost everything in the Rich Dad series. He's read all of Trump's books like Perfect. Art of the Deal and and Midas Touch and you know, the uh, richest man in Babylon and several other things. And I'm like, that's yep. that's how that's how we got him young is get him get him into audiobooks. That's right. <laughs> I, you have to I mean it's like you can either send them to public school and they get indoctrinated with one thing, or you homeschool like you are and we do a homeschool hybrid. And, or we indoctrinate them ourselves into our way of thinking. And a school yeah. isn't going to teach our kids entrepreneurship, but I will teach yeah. my kids to be entrepreneurs. Yeah, absolutely. Get a lot more uh, freedom that way, at least a portion of it anyways. So yeah. let me talk then about your superpowers, right? Every iconic hero has a superpower, whether that's, you know, the fancy flying suit made by your genius intellect or the ability to call out thunder from the sky or if you're Superman, super strength. In the real world, heroes have what I call a zone of genius, which is either a skill or a set of skills that you were born with or you developed over the course of your career that really energize all of your other skills. And the way I like to frame it for my guests, if you look at all the skills that you've developed over your career, there's probably a common thread that sort of ties all of those together. So with that sort of framing, what do you think your superpower in business is? Delegating. My ability to actually pass on like very critical activities that is absolutely required for the business to succeed. I am very, very effective at delegating to whether it be somebody who knows very little about our business, whether it's somebody, you know, internal that, that knows a lot. I think that's something, it was really hard in the beginning, but I was always okay. Like just, I, I gotta just like, I gotta try. And then I'd be okay with the failure. And I think another, you know, kind of a level to the superpower is the ability to allow people the latitude to fail and allow people to go learn a lesson. And so you know, I have a motto, we have a motto within the business. It's like fail fast, go make a mistake. Now there's no excuse for making that same mistake a bunch of times in a row. That's just stupid, but go make a mistake, go try something. If you're not making mistakes, you're not trying hard enough. You're not doing enough and innovating and doing all those things. So I have no issue with giving massive leeway and putting somebody in a position where they may fall on their face, but they're, well, when they come out of it, they're going to be unstoppable. And so I would say that yeah. that kind of package is, is my superpower. I love that. I know uh, we, one of our core values that I've got listed in our handbook is uh, failure is, uh, are the stepping stones to success. When we talk about that on all yeah. of our company meetings, is it like, hey, you know, the purpose of failure is to basically pave the road for success. And, yep. you know, the only reason it doesn't work is if you repeat the same mistake. Right. So if you yes. adjust your processes, you fix things, you learn from them, then that's how you that's how you achieve things is is with failure. So I love that. And I'm curious, my next sort of like question, just to dive a little bit deeper into that is I know delegating is a hard thing. And it's something that like I kept my business really small for a really long time because I didn't know how to let go of things. And so the biggest question I learned to ask myself that changed everything for me was it was a, a mentor of mine. He was like, he was like, you just like, when you leave here, go and hire someone. And I was like, I can't hire someone. I don't have the money for it. And he was like, he's like, no, you don't understand. You absolutely have to hire someone to do this thing. And he's like, just go home and do it. I vacillated on that for like three months before I actually did it. And the shift for me <laughs> The perspective on the other side was realizing that the question I was always asking myself is, should I do this myself 
or should I hire someone else to do it? And that is a poor person's question because the answer is always I should do it myself yeah. because I can do it better, I can do it cheaper, and I can yeah. do it faster. Yeah. And what I realized um, when I hired someone, what my mentor was trying to get me to, to do is when I hired someone and they were on my staff full time, the question I shifted to asking instead of should I do this myself or should I hire them is what do I have on my plate that I can take off and give to them? right? Give to someone else. Yeah. And then I, you know, there was that, that big realization on the other side of like, oh, I've got twice as much resources available to me, which significantly outweighs whatever benefits of better, cheaper, faster come from me doing it myself, because now I've got 18 people doing that kind of stuff. It doesn't matter how good or fast I am. I cannot outperform 18 people. <laughs> right. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I love that you know, that concept because delegating and getting and, and people releasing responsibility onto other people is really challenging. It's hard for people, even the simplest of things. And so we all have a laundry list of things that are in our mind that we go, we need to get all these things done, but who's going to do it better than me? Well, that's a, that's a really poor person's, you know, is, you know, I guess question to ask is who can do it better than me? Because the reality is, is that who's going to get it done is the question. And if you were to be dead honest with mm -hmm. yourself, the majority of that list that's going on, you are not going to complete. And so I always like, you know, one of the things where we really scaled the business that I love to tell this to people who are trying to understand delegating and, and releasing responsibility is I said, look, zero people on this planet can sell my, my services better than me. Nobody can. I like I am charismatic in the process of sales. Like I really understand what we do. I can find the pain points, you know, that, that somebody's struggling with. I'm going to find my way in and I'm going to close more sales than literally anybody, no matter how good of a salesperson they are. Like my thing, it, like I'm the best at it. And because I'm the best at it, that was really hard to let go. And that was one of the last things that I was able to let go of was sales until I come back to the same methodology I have with everything else, which is yeah, except if somebody's half as good as me, but I had three of them, the three of them combined are way better than me at my best in volume. And so they may close 50% mm -hmm. and I would close a hundred because I'm awesome. The three of them now close 150% and they're better than me. And no matter what I could do, I can't, I can't do the volume that they can do. And so then I go, well, what if we had 10? I'm like, what if we had 10 only closing 20%? They're still closing two times more than me and they suck. Now imagine if they were decent, you know? And so c coming through that realization and going like, oh my God, like I held myself back from massive growth all because I just sat around going, but I need to be the one doing the sales. And so that was like the last yeah. leg that I passed off. And then all of a sudden it was like, okay, all the businesses are hands off. Now I don't operate them. And then as soon as that I got that going, then it was like, okay, here's the full process. This is how we build. This is how we replicate. This is how we can do this with anything. I could not agree more. It was it was the biggest realization for me. And it was really striking for me because like the first month that I had someone full time on my staff, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to pay for them. And after like four weeks, I was like, oh, that's how you pay for them. And now we've got yeah. 18 people on staff. And the, I was just doing math earlier with my wife because we run a, a podcast post-production company. And so we help produce the podcast and the YouTube videos and the blog posts and social media content that gets published out. And I was just doing it for the number of episodes that we've produced. We've produced a little over 32,000 pieces of content that's gone on to social media for ourselves and for our clients wow, over the last couple of years. Wow, that's incredible. Which is insane. But also like, I couldn't do that at my, like the amount of time that it would take me to do all of that work would be insane. I couldn't do it. And yet our team yeah, is producing absolutely. that. Yep. <laughs> so it's, there's something That's to amazing. that volume play. And um, I'm at the same point right now where I was like, it was about two months ago, I was the only one doing sales. And I was like, I'm going to strangle the business by being the only one who does sales. So we hired our first salesperson yep. and I'm really looking forward to like, we're trying to get his calendar full this month and next month and whatnot. And then, you know, I, get to a point where we can hire 10, 15 salespeople. And I'm like, it doesn't matter how good they are, like how good versus how good right. I am. If they will take the calls and do the things and, you know, not lie to our people and, you yeah. know, overpromise, you know, overpromise what we can do. Like that's, that's pretty much our, our biggest danger is to getting people to say things we can't do. But like, other than that, we can grow I know just exponentially. There's only upside. Yeah. There's only upside for you. And, you know, if you get really focused on just having really good sales conversations with your team and actually like, okay, so how are your calls? You know, go back and listen to their calls. 
you know, hear what they said, how they said it, what, whether their timing was off, how they overcame an objection, like all of those things. And if you actually do that religiously and you make that part of like, I'm still part of sales for now. And you do those things and you do those things and, you, and they are going to, gr- they're going to get so much better, so much faster. And then all of a sudden they don't need you. And now it's like, okay, now you've got, now you've got the, the humming machine there. And so that was really, really helpful yeah, in the yeah. beginning for me. Now I have a sales manager who's like, he can train a team in a minute. Yeah, I am looking forward to that point because, man, my my goal for forever has been I want to get I call it the bus rule, which is kind of morbid, but like I want the business to survive me getting hit by a bus. Hundred percent, absolutely. We have that conversation all the time. What yeah. happens if Joe gets hit by a car? Yeah, that's that's the that's yeah. the question we ask ourselves. Adult, my wife asked that question. What do we do if Joe gets hit by a car? And it's like, all right, we have everything covered. Don't you worry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I said, we're, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. Right. It's like, and I have, I have a whole list of like who, one of our things in our project management system is like all of our standard operating procedures. And mm-hmm. one of the little fields on it is who owns these processes. Yeah. And the goal is to get it so that Richard doesn't own any of the processes anymore. That's right. And Absolutely. That's, you own that's the ultimate sort of thing. Yeah. So I'm like, I own nothing. I, I want someone else on the team to own all of them. Uh-huh. <laughs> I look at it in the same way you look at like assets and stuff, right? You own nothing but control everything. And you should have the exact same strategy in the business where you don't own it. That like, I mean, I, the greatest is when you get told there's a new process that was built. You don't even know what it is or what it's for. And then you find out and you're like, that was pretty cool. Like they thought that up. They engineered it. They put it into practice and then they executed on it. And look at that. And we had one that just happened literally this morning. I watched it happen via Slack, like in real time, all these people talking to each other. Then, you know, all these things happen. These moving parts hit. You see the conversation happening over here in our our marketing tool. And then all of a sudden we see the end result, exactly how the SOP says it's supposed to be. And I was like, I had nothing to do with that. That was pretty awesome. (laughs) And I get excited about that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's where my goal is. I want to be able to take a week, two weeks, a month off and come back to a business that's bigger than what I left it. Yeah. When we moved to Montana, we, it was a huge transition. Like my wife has never lived anywhere except where she's lived. And I, like, I was a nomad before I met her. So I've lived everywhere. I don't care. I'll live in my car if it didn't matter to me. And then we picked up our kids and we moved our kids and, you know, decided that, okay, it was time for a huge change. And I thought, okay, well, one of the things that I need to do is I need to be, I need to be very, very present. I need to be around because it's a big transition. And so I took a, I took 10 months off and I didn't work for 10 months and I checked in about once a month and the business doubled that year. And so I went, oh, wow, they really don't need me. And it was like a really big eye opener. Nice. And so then I was able to kind of rise above that and go, okay, where do I fit in this now, now that I'm not in the business? Like, where do I really fit? And it was as a strategic advisor and an investor. And so, you know, I look at myself more as like a board, I sit on the board, right? And I oversee the business and the direction we want the company to go. And then we say, okay, great. What resources do we have to deploy? And it was really, really cool to be able that to take a lot of sense. Go, wow. Yeah. Yeah. They don't need me. <laughs> so, and I probably get so away here's, a lot. here's my question. And I'm sure the burning, the burning question, a lot of our audience minds is how do you go from solo to, you know, a board advisor in your company? What does that path look like? What's like, I know it's, it's a long sort of meandering path, but what, what are sort of your, if you could break them down, your, your, I guess, major milestones to accomplish that goal. Well, the cool part is, is we've replicated it a bunch of times with different businesses. And so it kind of became just a very simple process. And so if I were to say I was going to start something from scratch right now, what we would do is first create proof that somebody's going to buy the thing that we're going to sell. And so we, I would literally just me, I would go to the market and say, Hey, I have this service. I have this product, whatever it is, you know, give me money for it and then we'll give it to you. Right. And so we don't have a fulfillment process yet. what I'm doing is I'm selling something that doesn't exist. And I would sell the concept and go, you know, for example, visitor match, we knew the concept existed and I had access to the data, but we didn't have any way to fulfill it. And so we went out and we sold and we, boom, we got a bunch of clients. And then I went, okay, now what? And now we turned around and we go, okay, great. Let's go ahead and and figure out our fulfillment mechanism and how we're going to do it. 
then we teach that to a team. We teach that either if one person can handle it, fantastic. If multiple people need to be there, let's put those people in place. And literally we hire those people. And those are the first people that we hire is somebody to do fulfillment because the most important part for anybody who's probably solo is that you can't turn and do fulfillment and stop selling. And that's the cycle that, and the trap that most people get into. They sell, they turn around and fulfill. Then they go back to sell. They forgot about their clients. A client drops off. They close a new one. They're fulfilling. Go, they drop another one off. They close two. Like, and it becomes this, this wheel where they just like, ah, I can't get past, you know, 10 clients. And that's super common. Well, so what we do is we just put a fulfillment team in place. And we say, okay, great. Somebody else is going to do this process and they're going to fulfill it. And the cool part is, is when we bring them in in the beginning, we actually build the fulfillment process with them. So who do you think knows it from the very base? They do. So who creates the SOPs? They do. And then they can teach the next person and so forth. And typically somebody within that group, that original group, will end up becoming something like an operations director down the road. So then I get to focus on revenue generating activities. We keep bringing in more clients. They fulfill the service and we go, okay, great. We have service fulfillment. We've got sales. Let's get somebody to kind of manage, you know, client relations, customer, you know, satisfaction like that. And then we can kind of move on and, and pass off probably sales, right? And so that's kind of the smallest mechanism that we use to launch something from zero. And as soon as sales, I get to step out. Now I'm kind of looking around going, all right, we've got a fulfillment team. We got customer relations. We've got sales. All right. Now who can be the person that orchestrates all of that? And that's operations. And then as you get more people, then you can get HR. And as you actually have some money, you get finance. And then you can literally step out of the business. And that's how we do it over and over again. I love that. So we are at that second stage, right? Where we're, uh, our, our team is building all the operations stuff. I mean, we have the operations pretty much in place, but like the next part is getting the sales figured out and operations figured yep. out. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much the same thing that we started with. And I, I've had people tell me I was crazy for building operations first. I was like, we had a couple of test clients that were like willing to pay us. And I was like, listen, I was like, we're just going to stick with these two clients until we have operate like the actual fulfillment side, like just nailed. And yeah, that's, I'm that's, a, that's I'm whole, more of a fire process. ready. Yeah. I'm a very much like a fire ready aim kind of guy. And so I'm like, eh, let's go ahead and shoot and find out. Oh crap. We hit something. Now what do we do? Like, does anybody know how to like gut this elk? Like we should figure this out. Right. Like, I, we have no idea. And then like you figure things out on the, on, on the run and that's how, we test everything. And I think that what it's given us the opportunity to do is go to fail a whole bunch of times fast, um, figuring out what the market will and won't accept, do it unbelievably quick. And while we're doing that and we're trying and we're actually making sales and fulfilling on service and we're learning and doing all those things, most people are still trying to figure out what their logo is going to look like. And we just get way more done a lot faster because we'll just go ask, you know, ask people to buy our stuff. And most people sit back and they want to make everything perfect before they ask anybody anything. And I'm like, I don't even care if we have a brand name, you know, visitor match. When I launched that, the identity resolution business, we launched that we had 30 clients before we had a business name. Like we just called yeah. it uh, anonymous website, visitor profiles or something. We were like, yeah, we're just going to give you these things. It's going to be great. And then we were like, well, shit, I guess we should probably build a brand around it. So then we built a business. I, uh, push button podcasts brand we got from day one but that was that was accidental because of a mastermind thing but we didn't get business cards for our events that we go to and speak at until five years in oh nice. <laughs> and i was like, I, was like yeah. I finally got business cards and like so we some of these events that we went to regularly like they people knew us all and i was like i finally showed up on the events i was like look i got business cards this time and they're like oh you're finally a real business and i was like yeah yeah, yeah it, it only took us five right. years to become a real business and we get you know because that's what everyone starts with they start with their logo and their business card without having a service yep. that's proven in the marketplace or a, mar a product that's proven in the marketplace Right. So. Yeah. And I think that because of that, a lot of people, they move a lot slower than they could. And then they think that, well, business takes a long time to make money and, and make profit. And it's like, eh, or you're just not asking enough, enough people to buy your stuff. And that's probably the, the you know, the real issue. Yeah. More offers, more offers is always yeah. the solution. <laughs> make that's more right. Offers. Yep. I had yep. uh, one of our mastermind buddies. He always says, he says more buy buttons and he always spells it M-O-A-R. So it's like a roar, more buy buttons. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's, what you need in the that's funny. That's true. 
So, well, yeah. And, and I mean, there was a lot of data yeah. for quite a while on landing pages and on sales pages and stuff like that. Like you increase the number of, you know, buy now buttons and you just straight up increase sales. You do nothing else. Don't change the copy. Don't change the structure of the pages. And you just end up with more sales. And I'm like, I always think that's so fascinating. I'm like, it, it's yeah. just so simple, but yet, you know, Hey, make sure my copy's right. Yeah. Make sure I have the right image in and the right spot and all that. Yeah. And for like a service business like ours, the analogous to more buy buttons is literally just making more offers in the marketplace, talking to more people, getting yeah. more no's, you know, just you have to get more of that exposure of here's what our offer is and seeing what people um, respond to. Yep. Absolutely. Like you can't learn unless you're asking, right? You don't know what the market wants unless the market tells you. Yeah. And so let the market tell you if they think your price is wrong, you're going to find out real fast that your price is wrong. And so there's nobody better to tell yeah. you anything than the people you know, who are supposed to be your customers. So I agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. So let's take the flip side then, right? So if your superpower is that delegation that you were talking about, the fatal flaw is, you know, the flip side of that coin, just like every Superman has his kryptonite or Wonder Woman can't remove her bracelets of victory without going mad. You probably have a flaw that's held you back in your business, something you struggled with. For me, I struggled with that perfectionism thing for a long time, right? That's what kept me from hiring people forever and kept me from shipping. But I think more important than what the problem is, what the flaw is, is how have you worked to overcome it so that you continue to grow your businesses the way that you have? I, well, actually, this is kind of funny. So my flaw is that I don't like operating my companies. So my, it ends up perfectly aligning with the fact that I'm really good at delegating, but my big, my, a huge flaw to me is that I, I can get bored really fast. So the business grows, the business becomes, you know, profitable. We, we're making money. All things are firing on all cylinders and I have no interest whatsoever. And I, the, so the challenge with that is when I'm in the middle of the business and I'm actually functioning within the business and I have a role within the business, I become a bottleneck and I actually cause issues in the business and I don't let us grow. And so my method is, is to use my superpower and delegate and put people in place so that I don't have to be that part of it. And instead I could stay where my interest lies, which is like in the creation piece of it. I love the beginning. I love the uh, projection of what could be coming. And I like to kind of, I'm a, my wife would say like, you're a Pisces, so you're a dreamer. And I, I don't know anything about astrology, but I always kind of bring that up because it's kind of funny. Yeah. I like the dream side of it. I like to talk about, okay, well, if the company's here and we want it to go to here, how do we do that? Like what part of it needs to be there? And that's the part that gets fun. It's like, okay, cool. So how much money does that require? So what's the, what's the capital allocation I need? What's the human capital allocation? You know, what might be the technology that's going to be involved in that? And then I get to say, hey, delegate, go. You guys go do it. And then we get to check back and say, okay, cool. How did, how's it going? And then we can, you know, redirect and do all that stuff. But yeah, my biggest uh, flaw is probably that I get bored too easy. Yeah, I feel that really hard because I am... <laughs> I don't know exactly what the uh, the term is for it, but I really like having a problem to solve. And as soon as I've solved the problem, I no longer care about the solution. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> so I'm like, I think that, that probably I'm aligns like, really well like, with what I mean. Yeah. 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 Because like I will develop really cool software or serve, you know, like whatever the, the thing that is that's going to solve the problem. And then our team is like, wow, that's really amazing. I can't believe you did that. But then like it needs to, then it needs to get used. Right. And right. like, you know, someone needs to actually like operate the process regularly. And I'm like, I just don't, I don't care. I should yeah. care, right? That's the process that our, our yeah. staff is using that our clients are getting their results from and all that stuff. But I just don't because it's not interesting anymore because I already solved it and I want yep. a new problem to solve. And I, yeah. I, I struggle with that That's regularly. Awesome. And so I have to, I, for me, I spent a long time struggling with that because I was, I had that and I didn't pair it with delegation. So I just had delivery problems. Oh yeah. <laughs> And it wasn't until I sort of learned how to do the delegation thing. And that's not my superpower. I'm not great at it. I'm still learning how to do it, how to do it sure. well. And But that's been, for me, it's been the big unlock is learning how to get the the solutions that we develop into someone else's to actually do the work regularly. Yeah, that is an absolute unlock. The moment you do that, like it, it really opens up opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I wish I was better at it, working on getting better at it all the time. But man, that's, it's like a superpower all into itself that I'm a little jealous that you have, but you know, you know we say some powers yeah. you're, you're born with and some of them you have to develop, right? So that's what I'm working 100%. on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with developing skills, right? Like we can't, you know, we gotta, we, we yeah. gotta work on our tool chest, you know, keep filling that tool chest. So 
I want to talk then a little bit about your common enemy, right? Every hero has an arch nemesis, right? It's the thing that they constantly have to fight against in their world. And the world of business, we like to put it in the context of your clients, right? And so let's, you know, since you have so many businesses, let's put it just directly in the level nine, level nine business and the clients that you serve there. And it's a mindset or a flaw that you're constantly have to fight to overcome so that you can actually get people the result that they came to you for in the first place. So that, what do you think the common enemy is in providing virtual assistance to a marketplace who needs them? The common enemy is just it. As simple as this sounds, it's somebody's mindset. You know, there's still a stigma around the concept of having somebody in a foreign country do certain things in their business. You know, in my company, my finance division, they handle payroll and we move a ton of money from my business account into all of our staff members you know, bank accounts in a foreign country and I'm not the one pushing the buttons. It's somebody in a foreign country who's actually pushing the buttons. They have access to run payroll and spend my money. And, but that was a mind shift that I had to get myself to the point where it's like, okay, well, how do we know they're trustworthy? How can I give up things? Like one, one of the simplest things is giving up your email inbox. And most people can't do it. They won't do it. And they think for some reason that this is so private and it's theirs. And if you really step back and think about it, there is almost nothing that comes through your email inbox that is so dire important that somebody else can't check it for you first. Like there's almost nothing. And it took me a long time to kind of get to the, get to terms with it. But I tell you what, one of the most liberating things that you could do is never check your email. Like, at all. So everybody knows Martina, my executive assistant, she checks my email. I get told what I'm supposed to pay attention to. So if somebody sends something and it doesn't seem important to her because she knows who I am and it doesn't seem important enough, like she'll either reply as me, she'll delete it, or she'll let me know that it needs to get, you know, that, that I need to pay attention to it. But it's everybody's mindset that there's just this, like you, you can't delegate certain things to whether it be overseas or, or even just somebody not sitting next to you. And so I think it's improved a lot because of the virtual staff world where everybody went and worked from home. I think it improved a ton, but I would bet almost every single day of the week, my staff gets hit with, can I really have somebody else check that for me? Can I really have somebody do this in my business? Can I, can somebody really do that? Can I trust them to do that? They're, that mindset is, is the one major hurdle we still overcome every single day of the week. And it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And I, I feel that I just like two months ago, and I've been running business stuff for more than a decade, two months ago, finally let go of my email inbox. And we got a, <laughs> a, a, an email course on like how to outsource your inbox to someone else. And I had my executive assistant take it over. And it's the greatest thing ever. I get hundreds Hunger. of emails a day. And he just once a day goes through and processes all of it. And I get one little section that says needs action. It's the stuff that I need to do something with. And he does okay. everything else. Yes. And I'm like, it is the greatest thing that has ever happened. And like from that, like one of the things is, is we, we have a, you know, you've mentioned being a nomad. We're nomadic. We have a, yeah. a virtual real mailbox too. So like physical mail that comes through <laughs> and, you know, just like anything else, we get an email that notifies us when a piece of mail comes in and he's managing our physical mail. So you know, scans the stuff when it comes through, forwards it to our address, wherever we're at locally. Like I don't even manage my physical mail anymore. That's and, right. Man, it's so awesome. It's, it's good. It's so awesome. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know the, the, the getting rid of your inbox, even at your physical mailbox, because I've done the virtual thing before as well. It's like the coolest thing. It's like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, I don't have to check my email. How much time do people get lost in their email inbox? right? It pings. They stop doing the work that they're doing. They go in, they jump in their email. They send a response, check another couple messages, send another response. 30 minutes went by. They're totally derailed from the task that they were on. Now they're going to kind of come back, but they're also going to pick up their phone. They're going to surf social for a minute. Then they're going to kind of get back on track and, and, you know, 45, 50 minutes go by that they just burned. Versus again, you and I, we look once I, I look at, I look at a Slack message, which literally is, Hey, here's what's going on in your, in your inbox that needs your attention. 
it's all sitting in the inbox if I want to go check it out, but I get it in Slack. And then I review the Slack and I just tell her, I just tell my assistant what to say to who, to when done. And that's it. And then she sends it on yeah, my behalf. I need to do that. The story. So yeah, it's sweet. I, we don't use Slack. We use, we use Google chat workspace. And so like, I have my own little, like Richard's personal space. And I like my goal now that I've sort of seen the light, so to speak, is I'm trying to get it. So yeah. like anything that anyone needs to communicate with me doesn't hit me first. It hits someone else first. And then it ends up mm -hmm. in the one thing that I want to check, which is the one little Google workspace chat. And I want nothing else. Yeah. Like I want that one little thing. So if something pings in my Google workspace chat, then I know I should pay attention to that. And I don't want to check. Yeah. I don't want to check like our, you know, twist messages or Slack messages or Facebook messenger or LinkedIn messages or the CRM message things that comes in. Like there's so many people that want to talk to you. And the more and more, you know, I said, we've only gotten a couple of things off of the plate now. So far it's been email and then the physical mail, but I'm like, okay, Okay. Now that I've got a taste of the, of, you know, a taste of what it's like, I'm like, okay, how do I manage it so that everything is not touched by me and it's touched by someone yeah. else? And yeah, that's, that's the ultimate goal. <laughs> yeah. What's well, been really empowering. And I think it's had a huge impact into the businesses as well, is that as I've removed myself from all of those kinds of things, it's opened. Well, I mean, I just have more time than anybody right? I just like, I have tons of time. And so I can turn to my team and we're running a, a decent sized business. And so it's, it's important that nobody feels like they don't have the resources that they need. Now they have their layers of, of management and leadership and so forth within the company. However, what's been amazing is the ability to tell anybody in the company, Hey, I'm available for you. Like if you need me, I'm available for you. And every single person, no matter what level of the company they exist and they operate, they know for a fact that they can reach out to me direct if they ever needed anything. And I think that has created so much more, you know, just such a strong culture within our, within our companies. It never gets abused because I don't check it first. <laughs> and if it is something that's just not necessary, my assistant will respond on my behalf. And, but what it's done is it's created this opportunity where I have so much available time that I can actually give people my attention if it's necessary. And that's been pretty powerful for our culture. That's really cool. Yeah. We're, we're small enough that I don't have to worry about that too much. I'm still available to everyone, but yeah, I like, I like keeping that going. And yeah, the, the goal for me is to just get out of, to get out of everything. And like I, my other big win on the operation side was getting out of all the operation side, the actual service delivery. It's like, and I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs that see this happen is like the the customers will ask you, they'll ask you things like, how's yep. this going? How's the other thing going? Oh. What's going on with this? What's going on with the other thing? And starting to retrain all of my clients to the point now is like, I literally don't know. Like if you want a good yeah. answer, ask your operations manager, right? Ask your show manager, yeah. ask, like ask yep. this person because I'm going to have to go ask them. So if you want the answer, yeah. you have That's their it. information, you have their phone number, you have their email, you have their Slack, you have their Slack channel. Like, like, if you ask me, it's going to take you longer to get an answer than if you just ask them. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You want to be efficient? Yeah. Go to the source. <laughs> that's right. I'm not the source anymore. <laughs> I know almost nothing. Go to the nothing. source because that's, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the source. So that's my goal. Yeah. I want to know nothing except, you know, the things that I like doing. I like speaking on stage. I like getting up in front of a group of people and talking about what we do. That's fun for me. Other than that, I don't want to do anything else in the business. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. So That's awesome. Cool. So I got... Just a couple more questions for you. I want to talk about, you know, if your common enemy is what you fight against, then your driving force is what you fight for, right? So just like Spider-Man fights to save New York or Batman fights to save Gotham or, you know, Google fights to index and categorize all the world's information. What is it that you are fighting for in your business, your mission, so to speak? So my mission is to provide opportunity for everyone around me within my company, clients, my family, and to give them opportunity to actually experience freedom to experience whether, and, and freedom comes in so many different forms, but I'm very, very heavy into the concept of freedom. And to me, the, the highest value that I, I could possibly get is time. So I weigh heavily into the time freedom side of things. Of course, financial resources provide more of that, but I also like, I heavily weigh into that for my clients. So when they come to us and that's, you know, they're looking for their business to grow, they're looking to get things off their plate. We're going to support them in a multitude of different ways. One of the biggest things that I want to push and put on them is to give them the freedom that they thought of, 
when they started their business because nobody started their business was like, I cannot wait to work 15 hour days. Like I can't wait for that. Nobody's doing that. What they wanted was I'm going to be able to do my thing my way whenever I want. Right. And the truth is, no, you don't. Now you're married to your clients and your clients dictate your life. And so if we can help them get out of that and create freedom, then, you know, my mission really is, you know, partially complete on the flip side of that. We have such a gigantic impact into the lives of, you know, our virtual staff and like their families, we, you know, using like, for example, overseas work, right? Our dollar travels so much further in their culture than it does in ours. So while we complain, our dollar is de being devalued, right? It is still ungodly more valuable in their culture than it is and, and in their economy than it is here. And so the impact that our salaries create inside a household is it still to this day blows my mind. And then when we look and I, you know, I find out like a few weeks ago, I found out one of our team members is mentioning somebody mentions them by name. And I'm like, who's that? You know? And they go, Oh, well, you know, that's, that's my wife. And, but they had a different last name. And I'm like, wait, what? And I'm like, how many of your family members work with us? And he's like, like nine. And I'm like, what? And the, just, it blew my mind to think that hiring one person led to the impact of nine households, you know, or, or eight households being employed for them having the wherewithal to send their kids to school because they have to pay for school to be able, you know, they, they live multi-generationally, so they've got other family members live in. So one income could be impacting two and three different households at one time. And so I've got this mission on one side that I want to create massive freedom for my clients. And I want my clients to feel the freedom that I have. And on the other side, the impact that we can create by employing people in the Philippines, as an example, it's, it's just mind blowing what we can, what we can accomplish. And I feel like we're really, really doing well with that mission. And now it's just, how do we keep it going? How do we make it bigger? How do we create more impact? How do we, you know, provide more for more people? Yeah, I love that. I know um, I'm I'm sort of in the same boat, just like on the family thing. We've got like my my writer, for instance, she brought her dad. Her dad's one of our writers now. And her husband is one <laughs> of our awesome. virtual, one of our, our post-production people. And like my executive assistant, his girlfriend was like my best friend's executive assistant. She trained him how to be a virtual assistant. I hired him. And so like there, that's another family. And like one of my post-production specialists, his wife's working with us now. And so we've got like families over there. And like one of the things that I keep track of is I keep track of the number of people for whom our revenue puts dinner in front of them on the dinner table, right? Which is not our number of employees. Yes. It's a significantly larger number. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it's, that, it's remarkable. That it always blow, strikes it still me blows as really my mind. important. Yeah. It, it blows my mind when I find out, you know, one person's working and they happen to be, you know, the only person who's working in the entire household and they, they happen to work for us. And then I go, well, how many people like live in their home? You know, and it's like, there's eight other people that live in the house. And it's like, what? And our salary covers all of their life for eight other people. And I, I just like, I'm like, I can't fathom how did now, of course that's super normal in probably two thirds of the world, right? The multi-generational living, like we're the weird ones in the U S where we separate from our parents and do all that. But I still think it's fascinating how much impact we can create by just simply giving somebody an opportunity. So I just want to do more of it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And yeah, we're in the same boat. I'm, I'm really excited about growing our company from that side, that side of it. And the, the mission too, of like, just how your, what you do provides freedom. Like one of the things are the backside of our company, you always have like your business name, like our, our actual business name. It's not our, you know, our DBA is push button podcast, but our business name is called five freedoms. And the five freedoms oh, nice. are uh, political freedom, time freedom, financial freedom, spiritual freedom, and location freedom. And the idea is essentially that it's you don't have those areas of your life dictating what you can do, right? So political freedom is your government doesn't tell you what you can or can't do. So, you know, the time freedom is you, you get to decide what to do with your time. Location freedom is you get to decide where you do those things. Financial freedom is your bank account doesn't decide what you can do. And, you know, so on and so forth through each of those. And that's like one of the things that we talk about all the time. And I even talked to my staff about it. I was like, our staff all has, they all set their own hours. 
they all work for wherever they want yeah. to work, right? And I was like, the only thing that I require is that you get the work done by the due dates that they're due for. I don't care when you do them or how you do them or what goes right. on with it, as long as the work gets done. And so I was like, you know, I have that freedom, right? That's why I built a business. But like, we're trying to build a business such that everyone who works for us has the same opportunities for those freedoms. Right. Um, Makes sense. And, yeah. Yeah. That's impressive. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I like the five so, freedoms. That's cool. Thank you. <laughs> so got one more, you know, well, maybe two more questions for you. This one is your practical, you know, practical portion of the show. I call it the hero's tool belt. And just like every superhero has their tool belt with awesome gadgets, like their batarangs, their web slingers, or their laser, laser eyes. I'm going to talk about the top one, maybe two tools you couldn't live without to run six different businesses. Could be anything from your notepad, your calendar, to your marketing tools, your product delivery, communication system, something you think is essential to getting your job done that you play with every day. Number one is high level. So we use the marketing automation system high level. I was actually their very first paying customer. And so I really dove in heavy, built everything on top of that platform. And my team became the first, you know, team to even use it, to service other people using it. And it became a major milestone in how we ended up growing our businesses and what we ended up offering to the market. And so high level would be the first thing that is absolutely necessary. And the, probably the last thing is probably just my iPad. And I know it's like, I use it to, like, I draw, you know, I draw sketch something when I have an, an idea. And then I just literally share that to a designer and say, Hey, create this. Here's my concept. I'll do a recording, a voice recording over the top of it. Hey, here's a landing page idea. I have, I want to test an idea and I want to go ask, you know, some people to buy this, you know, the thing that I'm going to probably do, here's a sketch of what I'm trying to think. I am not an artist, so I can't draw at all. So it's stick figures and boxes, but then I pass that off to, you know, designers and they do that. Um, I read most books digital form or audio. So again, iPad is still there. Yeah. I mean, you know, calendars on it, like it, it, it's a really, really effective tool for me. And so, yeah, I would say my iPad is my other, my other tool. What's funny about that is, you know, I have a laptop and obviously I'm recording this on a laptop because, you know, they, there's some things that your iPad can't do, but I ran sure. an experiment a while back when I was first getting into the whole delegation thing where I was like, you know what I want to do is I'm going to, I closed up my laptop and I stuck it in my closet. And I'm like, I'm not going to open it up for six months and I'm only going to run off of my iPad because one of the things that's really cool about an iPad is an iPad is not really great at doing work product, but it is really good at doing delegation work. And yeah. like keeping track of your team communications and delegating things to them, it is so much easier to force yourself into the delegation mode rather than actually doing things. Because anytime you try to do actual work on an iPad, you're like, you get stopped by the limitations of that kind of a platform, right? Rather than, sure. you know, a real computer, so to speak. And so I ran that experiment for six months and I was like, I just want to see how it affects my business and realized, you know, it was, it was a really impactful sort of experiment to leverage using an iPad as a, you know, as a CEO manager, you know, role rather than a doer of work product role. And because yeah. it just removes the temptation of like, I could just do this because you got your computer open. So for me, that was really helpful. I realized, you know, that's your superpower. So you probably didn't have that. But yeah. for those of us who are listening, well, who are like want to try that. It's a useful experiment and it's a useful tool. So one other thing that actually I've noticed that, and I didn't recognize it until you just started saying that, that's actually pretty cool is when you're doing things like on an iPad, you, you maintain better focus. Right. So like when I'm at home and I'm in my home office, I've got dual monitors, right? You're on a decently powerful computer. I can open up multi screens. I can use, you know, Slack over here and email under, you know, Chrome and so forth. And I've got, you know, 30 tabs open and all this stuff going on in an iPad. You can run one app at one time for the most part. Right. If you like, for example, if I open Slack and I'm going to go through that, like Slack is open. If I'm going to open email, email's open. That's all right? If I'm going to be drawing, I'm going to be doing my notes. That's the only thing that's open. There's nothing to distract me and get me checking this other tab. And oh my God, a, a ping just hit and all these things. Cause you turn notifications off, like you're good. And so that is an interesting thing. I, I actually hadn't really thought about it, but it does help keep me focused. And so maybe that's another reason that I like it because I can, I can get easily distracted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think and that's why I have six businesses. I feel that right. I'm, I've got three displays in front of me. I've got this one in front of me, I got a display here. I've got the laptop there. I've got three displays in front of me. But man, having the, the tablet is one of those things. It's it's really useful. Yeah. And I've also decided that the smaller tablet is the better one for the same reason, right? Like the, the iPad mini, oh, it just, bet. it forces you like, it's it's even harder to do actual work on it. So you do the little one and right. it's just, yeah. just management and delegation. <laughs> 
Yeah, um, no, I hear you. That works. Cool. Speaking of heroic tools, I want to take a few minutes to tell you about a tool we built that powers the Hero Show and is now this show's primary sponsor. Hey there, fellow podcaster. Having a weekly audio and video show on all the major online networks that builds your brand, creates fame, and drives sales for your business doesn't have to be hard. I know it feels that way because you've tried managing your show internally and realize how resource intensive it can be. You felt the pain of pouring eight to 10 hours of work into just getting one hour of content published and promoted all over the place. You see the drain on your resources, but you do it anyways because you know how powerful it is. Heck, you've probably even tried some of those automated solutions and ended up with stuff that makes your brand look cheesy and cheap. That's not helping grow your business. Don't give up though. The struggle ends now. Introducing Push Button Podcasts, a done-for-you service that will help you get your show out every single week without you lifting a finger after you've pushed that stop record button. We handle everything else, uploading, editing, transcribing, writing, research, graphics, publication, and promotion, all done by real humans who know, understand, and care about your brand almost as much as you do. Empowered by our own proprietary technology, our team will let you get back to doing what you love while we handle the rest. Check us out at pushbuttonpodcast.com forward slash hero for 10% off the lifetime of your service with us and see the power of having an audio and video podcast growing and driving micro celebrity status and business in your niche without you having to lift more than a finger to push that stop record button. Again, that's pushbuttonpodcast.com forward slash hero. See you there. And now back to the hero show. So I got one last question for you, and it's about your guiding principles, right? One of the things that makes heroes heroic is that they live by a code. For instance, Batman never kills his enemies. He only ever brings them to Arkham Asylum. And I learned recently that Spider-Man always pulls his punches because he's worried he's going to kill someone. So as we wrap up the interview, I want to talk about the top one or two principles that you use, use regularly in your life. Maybe something that you wish you had known when you first started out on your own entrepreneurial journey. Actually, one of the things that's, you know, I was kind of reviewing this question. I thought, I, I thought about how how to kind of answer it. And the first thing that came to mind is like what I decided to go with. And really it's, it's, I have non-negotiables. And I think that like my, my strength and what kind of keeps me going is that when I, for example, I make a commitment to my kids, it's ha like, it's happening. It doesn't matter. Make a commitment to my wife. It's happening. There is no going back. Once I give somebody my word, I will follow through and I will execute and I will do what I have to do. And I'll go to the end of the earth to make sure that I fulfill my obligation that I committed to. The same thing goes in my companies. And so as an example, you know, on the staff side, right? Because we kind of have two separate sides of level nine virtual. We have the stat, the, the virtual assistant side where we actually have to recruit and retain virtual assistants. And then they work with our clients. So then we have the client side where we have to go you know, acquire clients and get them to pay a service so we can have both of these. So we have kind of like two sides to, to the business that we have to go get the thing to sell. And so I, I have this same principle for both sides of it. And it's, it's completely around just integrity and somebody's commitment and what the same guiding principle that I live by, which is a non-negotiable, I do what I say. If I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. You have to do the same thing. And that is a non-negotiable in our culture, it's something that I just straight up live by. The company has to live by it. Every virtual assistant has to live by it. And our clients have to stand up to it. They have to do it. And so if a client tells somebody, you know, tells one of our staff members that something's going to happen, they need to execute and they need to do it. And if they don't, we're going to call them on it. And we're going to make sure that we set our boundaries. And if that means we lose the relationship with the client, so be it. But our clients are going to respect the boundaries, the expectations and everything with, with our virtual assistants. And likewise in the, in the reverse, our virtual assistants will always do everything in their power to execute what they say they'll execute, put the business first, do the right thing in the best interest of the client, the company and so forth. And at the same time with all of that, they will never, you know, fall short on their own values. And so that's what I would say is probably my guiding principles is like, we just have a set of non-negotiables and it's primarily around, you do what you say, you follow through, you go to the end of the earth to, to make sure that your word is, you know, is the truth. And, and I kind of make everybody around me do the same thing. And I'm kind of like a one strike you're out kind of guy. <laughs> like, so it's like, you know, you know, the rule, if you break the rule and we see that you broke it, not made a mistake, mistakes are fine. Failures are fine broke it. You broke your word done. Like zero tolerance. So that's one of my guiding principles. There we go. Yeah. I like that. 
I like that. Zero tolerance for, for integrity. One of the things I find fascinating is, you know, we're 260 some episodes into this podcast now, and I've asked that question to almost everyone. And 98% of the people have answered that some variation of integrity is the guiding principle for their business, which I've awesome. always found very interesting because the cultural narrative around entrepreneurship is that entrepreneurships are villains, right? That, that, you know, if you watch TV oh, shows yeah. or movies or read books or watch any of the kids shows, the bad guy is always an entrepreneur. And, but like in the real That's world, so when you actually talk to entrepreneurs, it's exactly the opposite, right? <laughs> that is so interesting. I would, you know, so I would take that, I would take that integrity piece and I would layer on top of it accountability, right? And being, and being responsible for our own actions. And so, and that is very entrepreneurial, right? Like us entrepreneurs, we know it's all us. Everything that happens in the company is my fault. Everything, good, bad, ugly, doesn't matter. It's my fault. Yeah. And so I think accountability, responsibility, and making everybody stand true to what they say is so valuable. And so, yeah, th those would be my guiding principles yeah. for sure. If it's not your fault, you can't fix it. That's true. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Awesome. So that I think is a great place to wrap our interview. So I do finish every interview with a simple challenge. I call it the hero's challenge. And I do this to help get access to stories that we might not find on our own. So the question is simple. Do you have someone in your, in your life or in your network who you think has a cool entrepreneurial story? Who are they? First names are fine. And why do you think they should come share their story with us here on the hero show? First person that comes to mind for you. Rob Bailey, my buddy, Rob. Yeah. He was a mentor to me and he has a great story. He's done fantastic in business. He's a really good guy. Awesome. Well, I'll see if we can reach out, maybe get an introduction, get them on the show. They don't always see us, but when they do, we get some cool interviews out of them. But here at the end of the interview, I always do our send off in comic books. There's always the crowd of people who are there cheering and clapping for the acts of heroism. So our analogous to that, as we close, is we want to know where can people find you if they want your help in the future? Where can they light up the bat signal, so to speak? And more importantly than where, or who are the right types of people or businesses to reach out and ask for your help? Yeah. So if you're an entrepreneur and you need help just getting things off your plate, if you own a business and you need support and you're open to the idea of outsourcing and, and leveraging virtual assistants and virtual staff, please feel free to reach out. Level nine, the number nine virtual.com on the top right corner. You can book a call with my team. We're also doing a promo when I get on a, a podcast. We want to let people kind of dip their toe in the water, get a feel for really what the, you know, what we do, how we can, we can support them. You can get a trial of 10 hours of our service for 92 bucks. So super cheap. And you just go to level nine virtual.com forward slash trial. And you can sign up. If you want to chat with our team first, you can do that too, but we can take projects off your plate, get them done for you very, very quickly. And you'll learn all about it once you hit that page. So there you go. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on today, Joe, and sharing all of that and sharing your story with us. We'll make sure that the links are in the show description below this, wherever you're watching the episode on. Again, thank you so much for just coming on and sharing your story and just getting to hear a little bit about what you've done with your businesses. Do you have any final words of wisdom for my audience before I hit this stop record button? Yeah, I think just go out and make some mistakes, learn some lessons and get some stuff off your plate. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate having you here today. You got it. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of The Hero Show, where we work to shift the cultural narrative around entrepreneurship and celebrate the heropreneurs who make our world a better place. Don't forget to visit our website at theheroshow.tv, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or via RSS, so you'll never miss an episode. If you found value in our show, we truly appreciate a rating on iTunes, or better yet, Share it with a friend to help us spread the message of entrepreneurship as a force for good. Curious to learn more about the stories and insights of these incredible heropreneurs? Check out our in-depth interviews and resources on our website. Together, let's support and inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs as they embark on their own heroic journeys. Join us again next week for another episode of The Hero Show where we'll continue to explore the world of heropreneurs, their superpowers, and the positive impact they bring to our lives. Until then, stay heroic.